Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, welcome sure, to the fourth right, yeah. uh, virtual ML seminar at ET Austin. It's my pleasure to introduce Satyan Kale from Google Research. Satyan received his PhD from Princeton University in 2007 and currently he is a research scientist at Google Research. Satyan has received several awards, including Best Paper Award at ICML 2015, Best Paper Award at ICLR 2018, and Best Student Paper Award at Cold 2018. So he's an expert in optimization and machine learning, and his current research focuses on the design of efficient and practical algorithms for fundamental problems that appear in machine learning and optimization. And in particular, today he's gonna to talk about optimization algorithms for heterogeneous clients in federated learning. With that, I hand it over to you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I apologize again for all this crazy delay in getting the Talk, talk going, obviously I'm not an expert in Zoom, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, I'll still be able to have an interesting talk for you. Okay, so this is uh, about federated learning and it's a joint work with a bunch of co-authors. Uh, the primary work really was done by Pranit Karimiretti, who is a student at EPFL. Uh, and uh, also, so this work is also in collaboration with a bunch of other people, including Martin Jaggi, who is, uh, who is Pranit's advisor at EPFL, uh, Meriar Mori uh, Sashank, Reddy and Anand Tita Suresh, who are all at Google, and Sebastian Stish, who's a postdoc at EPFL as well. Okay, cool. So let's move on. Okay, all right, good. good. So um, I'm not sure how familiar people are with the setting of federated learning, so I'll kind of give a brief overview. So, so federated learning is a form of distributed learning where the idea is that you don't actually have access to data from uh, various clients. Um, instead, what you have uh, is that you have a number of client devices such as, so clients can be things like uh, mobile devices or even bigger entities like hospitals or financial um, uh, institutions like banks and so on. Um, so you want to keep all the data that belongs to the client on the client devices and, uh, uh, and you want to try to train a machine learning model using that data. So the, uh, so the model that you want to train resides on a server, which uh, you know, for the purpose of the discussion, we can think of as Google. Uh, and the idea is that we want to basically be able to train a model without actually transferring any data over from the clients to the server. Okay, so how does this work? Uh, so predictive learning proceeds in rounds. Um, so in each round, you select a subset of clients to participate in predictive learning. Um, and then what you do is you have a global model that's represented by this X in the server. So these are the model parameters. So you ship the copy of the server to all the clients. Now each client has, has its own local data. So using the local data, uh, they do some number of updates to the server model and compute their own uh, local client model, which are represented by this wise. And then the clients ship uh, the updates that they made to the, uh, to the global server model back to the server and the uh, server then aggregates all of these updates into uh, its own update to the server model. So you get a new X and then this whole process repeats. Okay, so that's like the high level view of how federated learning works. Um, so, so there are a few characteristics of federated learning which make it kind of different from, um, from distributed learning. Um, so these are as follows. So, so first of all, we are going to have a high uh, overhead in communication per round. Uh, especially if you're working with clients such as mobile devices, um, you, you might not always actually have clients available in each round. Uh, the, uh, the clients might be connected to the server on a kind of a spotty Wi-Fi connection or maybe a bad cell phone signal. So you don't actually have, you don't really have a high bandwidth really. So, so communication rounds come at a premium. So you don't want to uh, waste a lot of you know, rounds in communication. The second characteristic is that only a few clients can be used in any round of federated learning. This is again, very different from distributed learning where you can basically use um, all your, um, uh, basically all your data, you know, all your, uh, your data set at once. And the third characteristic, which actually is maybe the more the interest, uh, uh, the more the specific uh, point of interest in this talk is that the data of all the clients is very heterogeneous. Um, so, so we don't actually assume that the data for each client comes from the same distribution. So each client can have, have their own distribution. They can be very different, but each client draws uh, their data from very, very different distributions. So somehow we have to be able to reconcile all this, all the differences between clients and train a unified global model, which works for all the clients. Okay. So those are the characteristics of federated learning. 
Um, so before we jump into the, uh, the formalism for uh, federated learning and the algorithms that we will use to train such models, it is actually useful to distinguish between two different uh, uh, settings for federated learning. So, um, so I mean, we'll be basically discussing federated learning in both of these scenarios. So we call these the cross silo federated learning or the cross device federated learning. Um, so for cross silo uh, federated learning, you should keep in mind uh, federated learning with a few clients, a few large clients such as hospitals or financial organizations like banks and so on. Um, whereas cross device, you should think of it as um, learn federated learning with a huge number or potentially even infinitely many clients, okay? So this is the setting when you have uh, say mobile devices or uh, internet of things kind of devices which, have, uh, which are connected to the server through very, very unreliable connections, okay? So obviously these two settings uh, differ in just, just the number of clients, but also there are some other differences as well. So in the cross silo setting, uh, typically there's a large amount of data per client. So each hospital might have a huge amount of data. Each bank might have a huge amount of financial data. Whereas in the cross device setting, um, each, each mobile device, for example, might only have a limited amount of client data. So there's a small amount of data per client. Uh, the other major difference is that in the cross silo setting, you have persistent clients, meaning the clients are almost always available. You know who the clients are, you can always address them specifically. You can like select specific client and be assured that, there's a, that, that you'll be able to communicate with that specific client. Whereas in the cross device setting, the, the clients are kind of transient, okay? So, so mobile devices might only connect to the server when, um, when it's the night time, for example, and then the devices are plugged into a power source and they're charging or something like that. So, um, so, so we, are, we also never know which devices are actually going to be connected. You know, mobile devices might die, you might be traveling, you might have, not have a cell phone signal. So it's very transient like that. So, so you only have a few number of clients available at any given time and you have to make do with what clients you have connected to the system. So uh, again, coming back to cross silo, as a consequence of the fact that you have these persistent clients, you can, you can actually do stateful computation, meaning that you can actually store some amount of state in every client and you can actually use that state in order to um, inform your optimization in the next time you visit the same client, okay? This is again, not going to be the case in cross device for learning uh, where the clients have to be stateless because you never know if you're going to see the same mobile device again. So, uh, so basically all your algorithms need to, need to be stateless. So you can only access the client once, maybe do one round of communication with them and then they're gone, okay? So you don't actually store any information in the client device, okay? So, so these differences are important to keep in mind when you are looking at um, algorithms for predictive learning. Um, so the first setting we'll look at is the cross silo one. I will talk about uh, the cross silo setting and, and an algorithm that we have come up with for the cross silo setting. But before I move on, I'll take a quick pause uh, just to see if there's any questions about these settings. Okay, I don't hear anything. So unless my Zoom is again acting up, I'll just move on. Um, okay, I hear laughter, so that means <laughs> uh, things are fine. Keep laughing every once. Where? Can you see the video, Satyan? Can I do what? Sorry. Are you seeing our video? Yes, I can see the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you guys are all very still, so I wasn't sure if. <laughs> okay, so every once in a while. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's still here. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I'm so happy. You know? Audio. Who knows with things like, yeah, I mean, if, you, if this were all Google Meet, it would be completely flawless, right? So anyway, um, <laughs> anyhow, let's go on. Um, right. Okay, so let's formalize, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's formalize cross-silo federated learning, okay? So so again, remember that cross-silo cross has a few clients. So what we're going to try to optimize is, is a kind of an average of loss functions for each client, okay? So we're going to try to minimize a certain loss function, which consists of, um, so the loss function, the server parameters are going to be denoted by X. Uh, each client has their own individual loss function. Uh, so this loss function is denoted by FI. Um, and then the, uh, the C there, or is it Zeta? Sorry, the Greeks, Alex might com complain. So I think it's Zeta, I believe. The Zeta there represents uh, uh, 
client data that is drawn from a distribution. Okay, so there's an expectation sitting there because we assume that the clients have a lot of uh, that have a lot of data. So uh, so because they have a lot of data, it kind of makes sense to think of taking an expectation over client data. All right. Um, so we're going to uh, minimize an average of all of these expectations of individual loss functions. Okay, so that's the kind of objective that we're going to try to solve for. Any questions about the objective? Good. I see people moving, which means I'm still here. Good. Um, all right. So here are some algorithms for cross style of learning. I mean, the uh, before, I mean, the kind of the grand. Um, algorithm for learning is SGD. So SGD obviously applies to any kind of learning scenario, including this one. Um, so if you have to simply implement SGD for federated learning, this is how you would do it. Um, you would select a subset of clients S and then on each client S you would, you would take a large batch of their data, compute a stochastic gradient for the individual loss function and then average uh, and then send them back to the, to the server where the server basically takes all these gradients, averages them and then uh, applies the average update to the, mod the server model. Okay, so that's a very obvious way of uh, implementing SGD in the setting. Um, this is obvi this obviously works. I mean, it's equ equivalent to centralized training. Uh, equivalent to basically pooling all the data, and then it is very slow. Is that because essentially all you're doing uh, on the client is that you're computing one gradient and you're sending it back to the server. So because of that, uh, you might expect uh, somewhat slow conversions. Okay, so one simple way of, of converting um, HGD into something where the clients are actually not just passively computing gradients, but actually doing some kind of optimization is this method called um, federated averaging uh, or fed averaging, fed, fed averaging for short. This was this is the kind of the, the, the algorithm that is deployed these days uh, uh, for any federated learning scenario. Uh, so this appeared in the work of McMahon et al. Um, it's a very simple idea. So uh, because the clients have some computing power, they actually, instead of doing just one gradient, they actually take a number of gradient steps. Okay, so each client uh, that is selected basically uh, does uh, does k steps of SGD. Okay, so you're, you're going to keep updating the server parameters um, k times using gradients computed at each subsequent iterate. Okay. Uh, and then you ship the, uh, the the updates back to the server. The server aggregates them by averaging and updates updates the server model. Okay. So what is the intuition here? The intuition is that um, this should hopefully lead to faster conversions because you're actually um, faster conversions in the number of communication rounds because now each of each client is actually doing some amount of local optimization. They're actually doing gradient descent locally up to k steps. So you might actually potentially be faster than SGD in terms of communication rounds. Um, the only uh, the issue here is that it is actually not imp not actually minimizing the loss function that I wrote down in the beginning of this talk. So this actually differs from uh, centralized updates, and in fact, it can be shown that uh, this method may not actually converge to the right solution. Okay. So. So you have a benefit, you might have faster conversions, but you might be converging to the wrong point. Okay. Um, so the method that we will discuss in this talk uh, is, some, is something, is, is called scaffold. It has a convoluted uh, uh, backronym, you know, which kind of stands for something, but anyway, so the way, uh, the, so basically it looks a lot like uh, federated averaging. Uh, the only difference is that instead of taking a gradient step in each each local computation round, the, you actually take a gradient step with a correction. Okay, so so you'll notice. I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but if you can, I'm pointing to the update. <laughs> um, so basically, instead of just taking the gradient step uh, using the gradient at each point, you apply some sort of correction, which is represented by this term C minus C i, which is designed to actually make it mimic a centralized update, okay? Um, okay, so I haven't told you what a correction term is. I'll explain that in the course of this talk. Uh, but the idea here is that again, you potentially expect it to converge faster than SGD because you're actually doing K local optimization steps. Um, 
And what we can actually formally prove is that because of this correction term, uh, uh, each client is actually in some form mimicking a centralized update. Okay. And because of that, we can actually show that it actually converges to the right solution. Okay. So the way all of this works out will be explained in the course of this talk. Okay. So before we actually go into details of this correction term, let's try to understand why it is the case that uh, Fed averaging might fail. Um, so actually this is a, this is something that was, let me just see if my slides transition. Okay. Um, so this was noticed by several paper, uh, papers that when you have heterogeneous clients, um, and meaning when the clients actually are, choosing, are sampling their data from um, very different distributions, then you might have this problem of non-conversions. Um, uh, you know, and it's, it's, I mean, it's, it seems reasonably um, intuitive that you will have non-conversions because each client is actually sampling from a different distribution. So when you start doing a local optimization on each client, you are actually converging to the local optimum rather than the global optimum. Okay, so it kind of makes sense that Fed averaging does not converge. So let's try to visualize this. Um, so let's say we have only two clients. Um, client one has a, has a loss function F1 and client two has loss function F2. And I've plotted here the, 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 um, uh, the contours of this loss function. And what we want to try to optimize is the average of these two functions. Um, uh, so, uh, so if you look at, um, oops, what happened here? Okay. Um, so, uh, so if you run SGD, then of course SGD works because SGD, uh, when we just take one gradient from each client and, and, and average them, we are actually taking an unbiased gradient for the, for the average loss function. And then standard theory tells you that the, the limit point of the HTTP process is going to be the optimum point. Okay, good. Um, so uh, when you when you uh, so now we, let's see what happens when you start looking at uh, Fed, Fed averaging. So in this case, um, so it, so after the first step uh, of a local updates in each client, when you take the average of the of those two iterates, you certainly get something on the HTTP path. But when you take a second step on each client and you average those uh, the updates up to the second step you start deviating from the shitty path okay when you take a third step you are going to deviate even more okay so so because of this when you kind of iterate this process you kind of start deviating away from the optimum and in fact another way of understanding this is is uh, is this so if, even if you actually initialize your, your server model to the, the optimum point, you might still start moving away from it because if you start from the server, from the optimum point, um, then uh, each local update will take you closer to the optimum for a, for the client. And then when you uh, when you average the local optima, you are going to end up with a point that is not the global optimum. So that's uh, so it's pretty evident that even even if you actually initialize the server model, meaning you might actually um, you might you might actually move away from the optimum point. Okay, so that's an intuitive picture, and we can actually formalize this. Um, um, so we can actually formalize this in terms of rates. We'll talk about uh, what happens here. Um, so there's a little bit of notation here. Um, so uh, with, uh, when you're talking when you're talking about convergence rates, but it's not scary. Hopefully, um, suppose we do R rounds of communication with k uh, rounds of local steps, and there are n clients to work with. And let's say your loss functions for for, uh, for simplicity are smooth uh, with a smoothness constant of L, and strongly convex with a strong, with a strong convexity constant of mu. And let's say this sigma is is the variance within a client. Uh, okay, so then. Um, standard optimization theory will tell you that SGD will converge at the rate that is shown here. So, so there is, um, I mean, there's a standard kind of a noise uh, noise term which depend which, which arises due to the variance within the client, and then there's an exponential term which arises simply because uh, um, the function is strongly convex and smooth. Okay, uh, this is what happens for strongly, strongly convex and smooth functions. If you have non-convex functions, then uh, we don't actually converge to an optimum point, but you can talk about conversions to a stationary point. And then the convergence rate looks like what I've shown here. 
uh, all of this is pretty standard theory. Um, so just to you know kind of discuss the rates, I'm going to hide hide the noise term uh, by this letter uh, calligraph because it's going to kind of all the conversions and it's not super important what the exact form for it is. Okay. All right. So if we so we could we can analyze uh, HD and Fed averaging, and this is the kind that we get. Uh, so for strongly convex functions uh, with SGD, we have the rate that I showed you in the... Now to talk about a rate for, for Fed averaging, we need to make a certain assumption on, on, uh, on the gradients. So it, it should be pretty evident that, that if the there's no hope of conversions, there is, if there's some amount of similarity between the clients, then we might be able to show a conversions rate in how similar the clients are okay so one way of capturing similarity is this notion called uh, b similarity so the what um if you look at essentially the uh uh the second moment of the uh, and that that uh, that is bounded by g squared plus b squared times the uh, squared norm of the of the average function okay so, so I can, in, in order to get a, kind of get an intuition for this, if, if B were zero, then G square would simply be uh, bound on the roughly the variance of the of the gradients across the clients. Uh, but B being non-zero also allows us to like uh, uh, kind of tie the similarity between the clients and the, and the central optimum. Okay, so if you assume that the clients have this kind of similarity uh, uh, then uh, uh, so well, these conditions were all studied in other optimization literature uh, kind of convenient condition to have um, so if you ask this condition then you can show that basically fed the uh, the conversions rate of is essentially the same as a shape but then like L V squared over mu squared. Okay. This is an extraneous term. This shows uh, slower than HD, at least in terms of communication rounds. Um, and obviously it is just an upper bound. So um, so you might question why this is so let me go over this in a second. Um, the same, same thing happens for again uh, the uh, in fair average, and is the term is the presence of this extra term here, which uh, which tells uh, how much heterogeneity, which depends upon how much heterogeneity lies. Okay. So so uh, it turns out that uh, uh, the is it's something that you cannot avoid. Uh, but I mean, to hire, it's pretty easy to construct this function, which have two comma g similar gradients, um, such that any uh, such that fair averaging with k bigger than so you need at least I mean you need at least yeah. I, uh, so um, Sorry, this last part, which you. I think is a little critical. Um, uh, your voice, I think, is breaking up a little bit. Do you want to try maybe uh, shutting down your camera for a little bit and and going over the, the important point here because uh, the audio was a little. I don't know if it was for others, but it was a little. Sure. Yeah. 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 yeah absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So I'll do that. Is that you can see I'm completely horrible at software. Okay. Or you could just try repeating. Okay, I uh, so I short stop my video. Does that did it help? That that's actually I can I can certainly repeat. <laughs> yeah, it was it was fine up okay. to after I so, this slide and the previous one. If you so yeah. Okay, okay, all right, good. I'll I'll so I'll keep the video off for now if that uh, helps. And uh, if you can hear me now, just uh, if you can't, just yell at least twice so I can hear you. Um, okay. Uh, all right. So what? So I was talking about lower bounds. Uh, so it turns out that you can construct an instance where 
if you run Fed averaging with at least uh, two steps, okay, so you need at least two. Obviously, if you, have, if, you, if you use only one step, then it's a shady and it converges, we know that. But if you, if you run for at least two steps, then you automatically incur this extra term of g squared over mu r squared, okay? So, so basically what this indicates is that this extraneous term that showed up in the upper bound is actually necessary. And Fed average so actually does bounds, right? have this kind of... And, uh, this, this part here, uh, the, the theorem that I'm showing here is a lower bound, yes, yes. And uh, so on the left is a lower bound, on the right here is an upper bound. Yes. Uh, so I think I seem to have lost. Okay. So yeah. So basically, we said that this upper bound. So we might you might question whether our upper bound analysis is loose, but in fact it's not because there's a lower bound which shows that um, this extraneous term is is necessary. Okay. Um, all right. So good. I, I seem to see you guys move pretty fluidly. So I, I hope you can hear me fine. Uh, all right. Good, good. So here's a quick demo, uh, which which shows the um, uh, run. You can construct. I mean, you basically use a data set and a simple ten line. I mean, evident from these curves that this purple line is actually it converges much better. Um, Fed averaging does. I mean, kind of eventually catch up with SGD, but it, it's very very slow. So you need to have extremely slow uh, client learning rates in order for it to actually start matching the performance of a shitty. Um, mm. But, and that kind of makes sense. I mean, if you have very, very tiny client rates, then essentially you are doing SGD. <laughs> You're not really moving in the clients. So eventually it will match the rate, but, uh, but it's still much lower. Okay. Um, so let's come back to scaffold, which is the, our correction, our, our way of correcting Fed averaging for, for this problem. Okay, so so what is the idea here? We are going to introduce a correction factor. Uh, you can you can think of it as a control variate. Uh, if you're familiar with things like SVRG or Saga or so on. Um, so here's a simple idea. So if we could if we could guess the direction of the centralized server update C, and if we could guess the direction of our own local updates, then we could uh, apply the correction C minus C I in order to push the local update to the, to the SGD path, okay? Meaning uh, if we actually uh, take a step in the, in the, in the um, if we take a step on, on, the, on each client, but apply this correction, which is this blue arrow back here, then essentially we'll come back to the SGD path, okay? All we are doing is, is correcting for the, for the drift from the, from the centralized path, okay? Good, so that's the, that's the basic intuition. Um, so how are we going to do this? Well, we'll just apply it at every step of Fed averaging. Meaning, so in the in the first step, obviously we come straight back to the shitty path. In the in the second step, we'll again start drifting away from the shitty path. But when we apply the correction term, we'll get roughly roughly back to the shitty path. We won't actually exactly be back because now we are applying exactly the same correction term for both of these updates. Mm -hmm. The same thing happens for the third step. Again, we drift away a little bit, but then we come back because. Uh, uh, we applied this correction. Okay, so there is still a little, little bit of drift, but it can be controlled. So it, it can be controlled uh, if the corrections are accurate. Okay, so that's like the high level idea. Um, so you can apply obviously do this for every client, and you 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 start drifting away from the SGD path, but you kind of stay reasonably close so that when you average them, you get close to the SGD. Okay. Um, so how do you compute these correction terms? Um, so it's again, it's very simple. Um, we use client state. Uh, the idea is to basically look at what happened in the past. So if, if if the past updates are given by these black arrows in the on, on the uh, on the client, then we'll simply uh, we'll simply guess that in the next round um, that we see, when we see the same client, we will actually be moving roughly in the average protection of all of these black arrows. Okay. So, so, so the uh, so the client control variate is going to be simply the average of all the steps that it took in the in the past round when it was accessed. You do the same thing for each each client, and then you guess that the that the centralized um, centralized detection for update is going to be the average of all of these control variates. Okay. 
so so that's that's the idea i mean i can i'll next i'll next shall go into the pseudo code just quickly but at at this point maybe i want to pause quickly and see if anybody has any questions about um about this basic idea so the reason that you're saying that this algorithm is only applicable to cross c lock splitting is because to create this c you need the ci for all the nodes in the system right yes that's absolutely right yes so we need to be able to visit the clients multiple times um and then uh, you know and often enough so that these uh, the ci is actually not very very stale because if you if if you visit them very infrequently then the uh, correction terms might be extremely stale and then uh, uh yeah and that we will they won't they'll be useless basically so um so that's why it's important to i mean this only applies to cross silo setting because now we can actually store uh, our kind of our guess of the direction in the on the clients and then use that as a correction term okay um so so the algorithm is very simple it basically does i mean i do again I, this is kind of a, a slide um you exactly were in the last slide in on uh, you keep um, keep your uh, you can you can kind of keep some state which is which is where your direction that you went in the past and and from the server you you get uh, the centralized direction and you apply that correction so so i don't need to go into too much detail about this but that's the that's the algorithm okay all right so scaffold works i mean it dashly works faster than nested as well in this case um, it's the it's the blue curve here so that's nice um uh so it it is also easily i mean possible to extend uh the algorithm to the case when you actually sample all the uh, sample clients um all you need is that you sample them often enough so that uh, the client and the 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 control variants are not really. um so, so and can... you can actually view the saga okay. algorithm as yeah um So, so it sort of seems like you know these control variants i mean I, i don't know i couldn't completely follow all of the pseudo code it seems like this makes this algorithm somehow similar to dual averaging or something where you're kind of averaging all the gradients from everyone over time and then making updates based on this sort of sum of gradients over right. time i i think yeah i think you, you can you can i think you, you might be able to think about it that way um uh yes but i i mean i don't know if there's a formal connection honestly but uh, it it could be could be i mean um i think maybe one way of looking at it is actually trying to i mean again is something i'm not completely familiar with perhaps you know better than i do but uh, if you're able to like connect think of saga for example yeah so so mm-hmm. it turns out that in the case when you um when you sample all the clients in each round then the algorithm yeah. that i just described is exactly saga mm-hmm. okay uh so uh, so maybe that's a, that's probably gives you a better intuition about it i'm not sure if you can think of saga as a as a regularized tool i mean not like that's just dual averaging algorithm yeah okay. i i'm not totally sure just i don't know yeah, they, they, yeah and and then I, at the same time i kind of wonder if dual yeah. averaging would somehow address some of these issues of you know the uh local updates kind of pointing in the wrong direction and giving some problems because you've actually kept right. this average pass from everybody. Yes. It's possible. I don't I, I don't have a good answer for that right now, but it's something worth thinking about for sure. Okay. Yeah, just curious. Okay. All right, cool. Uh I'll just move on. Um okay, so coming to if I can get let's see hold on. Okay. uh given to conversion rates um so we okay so i again I, since i'm probably not <laughs> of time um i'm uh, speaking the conversion rate look basically the same as what you saw for scd um i i'm not going to go into too many details but the main thing to note here is that there is no um there is no drift term that you saw uh, or the extra extraneous term that you saw in fed averaging that kind of disappears from here and that is primarily because um uh, this kind of correction achieves a kind of form of variance reduction across clients and, and so it it, uh, uh, it it actually eliminates this this extraneous term that you so on fed averaging which arises because of the variance between clients okay um 
So, so this still doesn't quite, I mean, okay. Uh, I mean, I only flashed the uh, convergence rates. Let's actually explain why. Uh, I mean, if you look, if you stare at this for a second with S equals N, you can sample all the clarity, okay? So, um, so then, then you might question, so, okay, so why would you actually take more than one step in uh, more than one local step? Because the convergence rate actually is, is the same. Uh, and in fact, um, I mean, uh, uh, okay, so we have a partial answer to this. Uh, so, so, I mean, okay, so, so one answer to this question, which I asked myself, which is kind of weird, but anyway, um, is that um, in the worst case, there's no way to beat HDD. This is actually, uh, can be proved. This was, a, this was the work of Arjavani and Shamir. Um, but if you actually uh, have a lot of client similarity, then perhaps you, you might be able to beat um, HDD. And then uh, taking more than one step might be useful, okay? Uh, and to try to formalize this, we might we can try to think about um, the you know how similar the Hessians of the loss functions are, and see if we can try to come up with some argument based on similarity of Hessians. Um, so we were not actually able to do it for general loss functions, but uh, for for quadratics, um, uh, we were able to uh, say something interesting. So let's assume that uh, that the the Hessian. Uh, so let's assume that that you have loss functions that actually similar Hessians, meaning that um, the Hessian of, of each uh, client loss function differs from the Hessian of the of the central loss function by at most of the delta, okay? And let's also assume that each uh, loss function is delta v convex, meaning all the Hessians have eigenvalues that are bounded by minus delta, okay? Note that smoothness already implies v convexity, so this is not such a big assumption, uh, always at most because smoothness, uh, but typically you might expect Delta to be much smaller than L, okay? Um, so in case you actually have quadrations, uh, which, which satisfy this bounded Hessian, um, Hessian difference uh, bound, then we can actually get a slightly stronger convergence rate, which uh, for, for strongly convex functions looks like this, and for non convex functions, looks looks like looks like that. Okay. So, roughly speaking, what is happening here is that we have replaced um, the dependence on L by exactly the same dependence on delta. So, the smoothness parameter, the dependence of the smoothness parameter L, has been replaced by the smooth by the by the dependence on delta. So, in case um, case delta, I mean, at faster convergence rate, and it also tells you that you should take at least L over delta. Uh, so all these convergence rates are in the case when you take L over delta uh, local steps, and, and then you actually get a, a, a faster conversions with the scaffold method than, than HDD. Okay. Uh, so this was actually, at, uh, to our knowledge, the first uh, work to actually characterize the importance of taking local steps. Um, and it, it kind of, I mean, it intuitively makes sense. I mean, if the functions are very similar, then you should take a lot of local steps because then you're kind of really trying to optimize the central function. But this is one uh, uh, set setting where this actually can be proved formally. Okay, so that's, um, okay, I, I am super short of time, I know that. So I'm going to uh, skip some kind of quick experimental results um, for a scaffold, basically, it works. It works better than Fed averaging and SJD. Maybe, maybe what is more interesting is this plot. Like, um, so so here's a, uh, where we change the similarity between clients, um, and uh, when there is no similarity, when similarity is zero percent according to certain metric, scaffold is, does much better than either SJD or Fed averaging. As you start increasing the similarity, averaging also starts performing well. Uh, and that taking a lot of local steps would be would be good. In the case when the when the clients are exactly identical, then there's no difference between Fed averaging and, and scaffold. It works really well. Okay. Um, so so here are some quick takeaways, which maybe I don't have time to talk about. Um, but uh, the the point here is that. Uh, uh, 
uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, if you want to use Fed averaging, that, that's fine, but you should separate out server learning rates and client step sizes. You should use a small client step size. Um, uh, but you can, but if, you, if you're in the cross silo setting, then you can certainly use scaffold. Uh, we can show that it converges faster than HDD and Fed averaging, and it's also resilient to heterogeneity and client sampling. But again, the limitation is that only works for the cross silo setting. Okay, so I, um, and this is all I want to say about scaffold, and maybe I'll take like a minute maybe to see if there are more questions, but I want to move to the cross device setting after this, uh, but we'll see. Okay, cool. So no more questions. So I just want to get like a quick time check. Like I, I probably have only like five minutes maybe. <laughs> is that right? Um, no, Satyan, yeah. Sorry. Take your time. Like, I mean, there's no strict limit. If you want, need more time, go ahead. Okay, okay. So I'll, I'll, I, I mean, I don't, I know I, I was, I mean, I was late in joining. So I'll try to wrap up in like the next 10, 10 15 minutes maximum. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. So, so let's, sorry. Okay, um, so let's go to the cost. You're looking where you have a large number of devices, uh, a small amount of data and device. Um, and again, they're transient uh, and you can actually cannot have any state. Okay, so that's the cost device setting. Um, so let's try to formalize it in a similar way that we did for the cross. Um, so again, the, ob the objective is going to look similar. So just a few key differences here are that now we're actually going to try to minimize, um, we are going to try to minimize an expectation over in the clients because there's like a large number of clients. So we basically, uh, we may never see them again and remember infinitely many. Uh, but for each client, uh, we are just going to try to minimize um, the, the, um, the average loss function over its data, uh, and and this is a and, uh, the number of data points is small, so this is this is like a uh, just, a, just a small average. Okay, so roughly speaking, the, the you know the expectation and the summations have changed roles between the cross silo and cross device setting. Okay, but other than that, the, I mean, there's not there's no huge uh, no, no real difference between these two formulations. Okay. Um, so let's start talking about algorithms for cross-device federated learning. Um, so uh, to motivate that, I'm going to discuss uh, a simple idea, which actually helps quite a bit in practice, which is to use momentum. Uh, so let's talk about um, running SGD with server momentum. Okay, so the way it's going to work is as follows. Um, again, this is SGD, so we're only going to take one local step. Uh, let's assume that we only have, we're only sampling one client at a time. Okay, so we just sample one client on each client you uh, sorry, not each client on, on that client uh, you take one local step using using its uh, using the local gradient uh, which is now actually you can compute a full gradient because you have only a small amount of data so you take that one local step and then you send it to uh, the server the server actually takes uh, a step in the same gradient direction but also adds a momentum term okay and now the momentum term is uh, is updated using um, uh, using the gradient that it just saw from the client, okay? And this beta is a standard momentum parameter, it's just less than one, right? Uh, so that's just SGD that's augmented with a server momentum. Um, so what can we say about this? Well, it does converge. Uh, that's a pretty standard result. Uh, again, just like before, uh, you might have to communicate frequently because you're essentially doing one communication round per update on the client. Okay, so... Um, so in, in a paper which, uh, I mean, a kind of a few papers which appeared over the last few years, uh, this simple idea was augmented into um, an algorithm called Fed averaging with momentum. Uh, so the way it works is that instead of taking, I mean, it's pretty obvious. So instead of taking uh, one local step, you just like not as normal Fed averaging, you take K local steps in each client. And then um, then you, you basically return uh, the solution that you computed. And you look at um, X, so X is the server model and YI is the model that's computed by the client. So X minus YI is the aggregate of all of the gradients that uh, gradient steps that the client took, okay? So we'll treat X minus YI as a, as a pseudo gradient, okay? And then take us 
um, step in the direction of the pseudo gradient along with a momentum term. Okay, so we'll update the server parameters by taking a step in the pseudo gradient direction, but uh, along with the momentum term. And again, the momentum term is going to be updated uh, using this pseudo gradient. Okay. So this is fair averaging with momentum. Um, so again, we might uh, expect it to converge faster because now the clients are doing some amount of optimization. Um, uh, so, so actually, so in this case, actually, again, you have these convergence problems uh, primarily because the clients are, uh, are are different. However, actually, helping. Uh, uh, so, what what does work here is that the, the presence of momentum term. So, because of the momentum term, you actually. Um, uh, correct for some of this planned heterogeneity a little bit because, um, yeah, so because it's only applied at the server level. So even if the clients are heterogeneous and then this um, gradient update is actually, uh, pseudo gradient update is taking you away from the uh, from the right path, the momentum term actually helps in, in this correction. Okay, so that's fair averaging with momentum. Um, so the algorithm that we came up with in this kind of setting is, is called MIME, and I'll explain why it's, it is called MIME uh, in a couple slides. Um, so this is the MIME algorithm with HDD uh, with momentum. It works as follows. So here's a it's a tweak to the uh, to the fed, uh, to the fed averaging with momentum. We are actually going to um, take uh, update, so we, so each client is going to update uh, as usual as as in fed averaging using gradients on its local data. But in each client update, it's also going to apply a server momentum. Okay, so, so this is the moment. So the server communicates not just uh, the uh, the client the server parameters, but also its current momentum. So the same momentum is applied in each client step. Okay, um, and and then uh, I mean the momentum is applied. Uh, so okay. So and the other difference that we make is that uh, the the, mom the momentum itself is is updated using um, the gradient of of the of the selected client on on the on the on the server gradient on on the server parameters. Okay, and the server uh, uh, the server variables x are just simply taken to be the average of all the client client y's. So uh, okay, so what's going on here? First of all, we might expect it to again converge fa uh, uh, faster. Because because it's, it's running k uh, update steps. Um, so the second thing that happens here, again, this can be put formally, but I'm just mentioning it here, um, is that the addition of this fixed server momentum each client step actually reduces the heterogeneity problem because now each client incorporates some amount of a central update into each of its, uh, in, uh, of its local, local updates. So that's nice. Um, and the second thing is that this general template of applying a fixed momentum, can we extend it to other optimizers like Adam or uh, Adagrad or any of these methods, which are, which actually have some amount of optimizer state? Okay, so this I'll explain uh, in a in a few slides. But uh, but at, at a high level, this is the MIME algorithm. Any questions? Um, excuse me. Uh, so yeah. normally in, in, in this in this momentum term you should have a summation over uh, over uh, the, the local funds. I mean there should be an average in your last formula, right? Otherwise you will have different momentums uh, with uh, different so FIs, no? Is this some uh, the summation over oh yes, yes. I, so here I'm assuming only only one client is up. You're talking about this update here, the server yeah, momentum yeah, yeah, update? Yeah, exactly, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so. Yes, you're right. I mean, uh, if, if you sample more than, I'm only assuming that you sample one client at a time, just for for convenience. If you if you sample multiple clients and you just take average of all of these um, uh, all of these gradients and apply it to the to the momentum update. Mm, okay, okay. Okay. Thank you. Does that make sense? Uh, okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. All right. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so I'll move on. Um, okay, so so what's going on here? Um, so uh, visualize what is roughly going on. Uh, so we know that if to the you know if you have to uh, roughly speaking the average of the local optima. Uh, 
so if you do fed averaging with momentum then it helps a little bit but unfortunately the conversions it only speeds up conversions to the average of these two uh, of this of, of this local optima which is which might not be the right thing as the uh, as the true optimum uh, so with 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 uh, with the with the fixed server momentum that mime applies uh, uh, the uh, so what we can show formally is as as that the updates actually converged to roughly but not exactly uh, the, the, the right optimum point okay so okay so now let me explain why we, we call it the mime algorithm it's called the mime algorithm because uh, it tries to mimic the updates of any uh, any given central optimization method okay so now we are going to start talking about an abstract optimization method it could be something like adam or hdd with momentum or anything like that so we're talking about an algorithm which actually has an internal state okay so in the case of hdd with momentum the internal state will be momentum uh, in the case of things like adagrad or adam it's going to be the accumulators that it maintains meaning like the per coordinate scaling factors that it maintains for example uh, so imagine that we are given an abstract uh, optimization method which uh, which works in the following way so so given a gradient and a current internal state s it uh, it up, it it basically updates uh, your parameters by some kind of update function u which is a function of the current gradient and the internal state uh, and then it also updates the internal state using another update function called v which takes also the gradient and s okay so if, as an example you can look at hdd with momentum uh the hdd the, for hdd with momentum the state the state variable is just the momentum uh, the uh, x parameter is updated using uh, the gradient plus the momentum and then the momentum itself is updated using the gradient plus the previous momentum okay anyway so just think about an abstract algorithm like this like and, and even adagrad adam all of these methods can be cast in this framework so what are we going to do now um on on the server level we are going to update the internal state of our of, of our optimizer using the gradients that we receive from the clients okay so what we are going to do is we are going to you are going to average uh, the gradients uh, for, for for the selected clients and use that in the v function to update our current state okay so this uh, so uh, so yeah this average is basically the same thing that i mentioned in answer to the previous question about updating the momentum good and then the clients are going to do this for the following thing so this is actually the mime light algorithm is slightly different from the mime algorithm so we it's uh, so each client is going to obtain the server parameter x and the server state s and then starting from uh, the initial point y equals x it's going to apply this update rule k times okay in each update it takes the update function u and applies it to a mini batch gradient but takes the same fixed server state in each update okay so in the case of momentum obviously you're going to apply the same momentum over and over again okay. so that's the uh, mime light algorithm as we call it um any questions about this general algorithmic structure okay um so there's there's a, a slightly different form of this which is actually the mime algorithm where we apply some form of variance reduction also within the update step okay so this if, this looks very similar to the kind of an svrg like update if you have, if you are familiar with that um it's at this point it's not super important to understand what it is but roughly speaking we are just trying to minimize the variance that arises because of taking mini batch mini batches within this update step okay so that's the mime algorithm uh, again it applies to any base optimization method uh, like hdd momentum adam adagram things um this is the pseudo code again i don't have time to go over it but basically what i described on the previous two slides explains everything uh okay so in terms of analysis um what can we say again we have to make a couple assumptions um we assume that the uh, gradients uh, are somewhat similar uh, they uh, again uh, otherwise without similarity we can't really hope to prove anything in the setting so we assume that the uh, client gradients have bounded variance so this is essentially a variance um, is at most g square and again we assume that the hessians are similar uh, the same delta bounded hessian dissimilarity that we talked about in the scaffold talk 
Um, except here that we don't assume that the functions are quadratic. They could be arbitrary, um, weakly convex functions, but having this kind of bounded Hessian dissimilarity. Okay, so under these conditions, we have the following convergence rates. Um, I, I'm not, again, I have basically out of time or maybe even over time. So I want to just maybe highlight a few things. Uh, so first of all, if you just do SGD, then you, then you get certain rates, which look like G square by S epsilon square plus L over epsilon. So if you use MIME with SGD, you get essentially the same rate as pointed here, except that the L term here, uh, the smoothness term is replaced by delta. So of course the, the higher order, I mean, the, the, the um, same, we hope to get better. Um, a lower order term is that, so that helps quite a bit. Uh, you can also improve the higher order term using momentum based variance reduction. This algorithm that was developed by uh, Francesco Arabo and Ashok Kutkowski. You can do the same thing. You, you basically, you would just take the momentum based variance reduction, plug it into the mind framework, and you get variance reduced rates, which actually match the lower body in the higher order term. But the lower order term is significantly. Okay. Um, Good. And for Fed averaging, again, we can prove that Fed averaging suffers from drift. So there's this extraneous term, which looks like G over epsilon to the three halves, which is unavoidable because of the blind drift. And again, this all of this stuff holds in a strongly convex case as well. Okay. Um, I think I am, I, that's all I want to say about the rates. Um, experimental rate works. <laughs> Uh, and I will stop with just this last slide. So I think uh, because I'm way over time, I will just stop here and see if there are any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Satyan.